Hello and welcome to Views from the Market. My name is Mario Negro. I'm a partner in the Private Equity NMA Group at Stackman Elliott. For today's special guest, I'd like to welcome Rob LeBlanc. Rob is the co-founder and managing partner of Ambit Partners. Ambit Partners is a fund that focuses on investing in search funds. Um, their real target focused on investing for entrepreneurs through acquisition. Rob, thank you for joining us and welcome. Thanks, Mario. It's a pleasure to join. Rob, I'd like to start by learning a little bit more about yourself, uh, your history, and and then learning a bit more about Ambit. And uh, I know Ambit is a new fund. Just had your first closing. Congratulations. It's exciting. Um, so I'd love to Thank learn you a bit about you and a little bit about you and the fund, please. Cool. With pleasure. Well, I guess I'll start at the beginning. I'm actually born and raised in Vancouver and uh, grew up there, went to high school there. Then I studied back east at McGill and had a brief stint playing some football actually in the CFL, which is not, doesn't have much to do with lower middle market private equity or, or search funds, but is the first job on my CV. Uh, I was lucky enough to play for the Edmonton now Elks for a couple of years and win a Grey Cup in 2005. But uh, I got the start, my start in professional life in management consulting, work, working for a top global consultancy based in Toronto and was lucky enough to get staffed all around the world with them. And that wet my appetite for international business a little bit. And then I joined a private equity firm in, in based in Toronto uh, for a few years. And then I went and did my MBA down at Harvard. And that's where I first formally learned about search funds. And uh, I also studied their uh, social enterprise and uh, emerging market venture capital and private equity. And that's what bumped me down to South Africa, where I've actually been for the last 10 years now. Um, I came down here originally to work on a small business incubator and uh, impact private equity platform that worked on lower middle market and particularly succession deals. So often buying companies from older owners without a retirement or exit plan and then recruiting and placing young entrepreneurial talent to, to step in and, and take over. And in the South African context, uh, those sellers were often white South Africans and the young entrepreneurs coming into the owner operator seat were usually previously disadvantaged South Africans of color that in the context of some of the empowerment legislation here in South Africa is, is, is a big push uh, socioeconomically. And so that was the impact angle to what was otherwise just a normal sort of succession transaction that you see in other parts of the world. But did that for the better part of eight years exited that and then wanted to return home to my roots to North America and more traditional search fund investing and started doing that on a personal basis in Canada and the US and a bit of Mexico. And from there, I realized there was just a, a real opportunity for search funds to, to enter the rest of the world and started meeting more and more interesting searchers, super talented young entrepreneurs well outside of North America, but they'd often studied business school in North America and learned about the search fund model there and were curious to take it home. But there, there was a bit of a gap in the capital markets, I guess you could say, in the sense that uh, these young searchers wanting to go home to their home country struggled to convince primarily North American search fund investors that their country was worth taking risk on. And then conversely, convincing local investors in their home market that search funds were a real thing or a model worth taking risk on. So in that sense, they sometimes failed to build traction in their search fund. And, and they were looking for investors who sort of understood search funds from North America but also understood emerging market risk and, and lower middle market sort of transacting in emerging markets. And I found myself unintentionally right at the intersection of those two things. And so reconnected with some, some partners I'd worked with in my prior firm who also had a background in SME investing and, and search funds from their time at INSEAD. And the three of us partnered up about a year ago to, to launch our first fund, trying to pioneer traditional search funds in, in mostly new and emerging markets about a year ago. And as you said, um, we got going with our roadshow in about February or March of this year. And in September did our first close. And uh, yeah, it's sort of coming up for breath now, working on our second close and then very busy deploying the first pot of capital. We've um, done 25 or 26 search funds now in 17 markets. And we've closed our first two acquisitions and working very hard on the, on the next three or four actually should close in Q1 next year at the latest. So it's been a busy time. Rob, con congratulations. I mean, Ambit sounds like uh, a, an incredible success story and a unique, uh, a unique thesis because you know, when we talk about the lower middle market and the middle market and, and doing deals, it's, you know, Ambit is unique because it obviously is investing in individuals who, who are uh, looking at acquisition through entrepreneurship. But even more interesting, it's doing it all across the world. 
Um, mm. and I'm curious, given that you're on the front lines of looking at it from a global perspective, I'm, I'm, you know, you said you, you've already done 17 investments at the, at this stage. What, what are you seeing out there from a global perspective? Well, what, what is it about, uh, the, the global lower middle market that Ambit finds unique? Well, I think actually, let me just step back and, and maybe throw a caveat on your, your comment that it's a great success so far. I think raising is a first indication of potential future success. But as we well know in the private equity game, the feedback loops are long. And so we wouldn't, we wouldn't jump the gun and say it's been a success just yet, but we've raised, which is the first step. Um, and uh, and hopefully the investments we're making bear fruit. And, and that that's a good segue into the thesis, uh, Mario. So I think we've done uh, actually 26 searchers now across 17 markets. And I guess... What we're first and foremost interested in is probably the talent. So to get into entrepreneurship through acquisition or search funds anyway, you're usually probably drawn to the young professionals th that are launching the search funds and you sort of fundamentally back their potential and their talent to go buy and scale a small business. But we find that particularly true of the sort of enterprising or pioneering spirits that want to go be first or one of the first few searchers in their in their own home market there's something different about the stitch of their sort of DNA, their entrepreneurial DNA that we find a little more enterprising, a little more resilient. Um, um, and that's, by the way, not to take away anything at all from uh, anyone launching a search fund in, in a more established market like the U.S. or Canada. But there's just something quite uh, intrepid about about folks that want to go do it in new places. And so that's, we're sort of talent first. We always, we don't have a, a top down or prescriptive view about what markets to invest in. We, we really follow the talent. And that's part of how our thesis is designed to not be, to be sort of market agnostic, but, but quite focused on great talent. And then when the searchers are then searching, I think a couple themes we see consistent across, across the world. One is that in general, boomer, baby boomer owners have inadequately planned for retirement and succession. And so there's a lot of interesting buying opportunities where sellers are in distress. And, and those reasons are different in different markets. Sometimes it's just simply demographic. People are getting old or tired or perhaps maybe sick. Uh, and COVID in particular has caused an extra stress in that system. But there's also unique opportunities. You know, you have like in countries in Africa, for example, where we led one of Africa's uh, first search funds and the first successful acquisition of by a search fund in Africa you have like a post-colonial dynamic where a lot of entrepreneurs are from an old uh, colonial power and they're getting older and no longer see as a future for themselves in the country necessarily, or more practically, their kids have moved back to the sort of European country and, and uh, their family wants to get back there too. And this entrepreneur sort of left stranded in, in the old country that they built their career and they've got the rest of their family back home in Europe and, and they're stuck wanting to get out and uh, are very willing to sell their company uh, in a in a very unique way. So we find there's very um, consistent themes of older people, older business owners that are stuck without a clear retirement plan, and searchers can be a great solution to that around the world. The the other thing is that in more frontier markets, sometimes once searchers acquire a company, um, markets tend to also be more fragmented, a little bit less professionalized, but also higher growth. And so there's a lot of room to make plays and, and grow quickly uh, for, for a young, talented operator. And also, you find that markets are sometimes further behind, uh, you know, say, North America and Europe. And so you can actually copy paste certain opportunities from the search world that have done really well in North America or Europe and find similar looking business models and sort of copy paste the, the growth playbook uh, on, on a slightly uh, de-risked basis, which is really exciting. And then the last thing we see is that in a lot of these markets, when you turn the focus to exiting out the back of the cycle, there's been actually quite a bit of later stage capital raised in a lot of these markets like Latin America and, and Africa and Asia, where there's bigger private equity funds or, or family office capital sitting waiting for compelling lo looking medium sized deals. And that's where a search fund, if it's done well, that operator has grown a business from being very much under the radar of, of a buyer like that to very much in the sweet spot. And, and that's where you can see some interesting multiples expansion um, and, and even premiums paid for, for well-run medium-sized businesses in these markets relative to, to back in North America. 
Rob, you had mentioned that the focus really is on talent. And when you, when you look at talent from a global perspective, you know, we often talk about what it takes to invest in, you know, entrepreneurs or searchers, you know, who are, you know, have, have that financial background, you know, have the certain skill sets to demonstrate success in being able to buy and, and run and grow a business. When you look at it from a global perspective, is there unique features to global talent that you're looking for? Um, we know what, obviously we look for in traditional searchers, but in your perspective, are you looking for anything unique um, when you, you look at the global talent pool? And, and frankly, in your case, your group set is so large, right? What do you, what, what's a differentiator for Ambit? What is Ambit, you know, given its global perspective, what's it looking for in, in terms of global talent? So it's actually interesting you ask what's unique about the global talent that's actually probably the unifier. So we actually try to make sure that the talent itself is actually quite consistently strong across all markets. And that's actually a reason that we do invest in North America. We we have sort of 10 to 15 percent of our portfolio in Canada and the U.S. And a part of that is a very conscious benchmarking to make sure that the best traditional searchers we're seeing in North America are at or you know in line with the searchers that we back everywhere in the world. So we actually try to apply a consistent bar with no concession or discount in any in any respect, be it skill, experience, or network um, that the searcher brings to a new market. What we then do look for is relevant experience and networks in the country itself that they want to go search in. So that would be unique. But in that sense, that's no different than, you know, Mario, you would look at a Canadian searcher and ask, you know, do they know brokers? Do they Are they plugged into different industry bodies uh, that are relevant for their search? And are, are they well-connected in sort of the lower middle market circles, service providers, brokers, et cetera. Um, their, old, their former jobs, their former bosses, their networks, sorry, their, their mentors, et cetera. Um, those are things you would demand a Canadian searcher have. And in that sense, we, we demand the same thing just of, of that person in their local market, be it you know Paraguay or Vietnam or Egypt. I, I have to ask Rob, it's a classic Canadian question. We always like to say when you look at the, you know, you, you gave a global perspective when you look at Canada from a global perspective, and you've obviously invested in searchers in Canada, what are you seeing in our market? Uh, what what interests you from us, you know, investment point of view about our market? Anything unique that you see in our market, um, or any characteristics that uh, from an investment, from a deal flow, from just from a searcher perspective? Yeah, there's a lot that Canada has going for it. I mean, for us, we look at the relative stability as important, and and the, the precedence that are afforded in the market. You know, it, there's a pretty well-trodden path now for value creation in Canadian search funds. And we are looking to some of our Canadian searchers to be almost anchors in a way, providing sort of the middle of the fairway shot for for what might for us be a, a much more diversified and, and risk-seeking portfolio on some level abroad. So first and foremost, we're looking for just solid opportunities in Canada, of which there's many. We have generally seen multiples bid up quite a bit in Canada relative to other markets that we're playing in. I think that speaks to how developed, deep, and sort of also frothy it is at the moment. Um, so our searchers are struggling to maintain sort of pricing discipline to stay in a lot of processes that they're involved in. I would say that's a common theme across the, the Canadian portfolio at the moment. Um, but all the things that make search work in the U.S., uh, historically are sort of consistent in Canada. I think there's great deal flow. I think there's particularly pockets that are interesting outside of the, you know, GTA, which is pretty well trodden by search. You know, we're in a couple Western Canadian searches, you know, in, in more obscure um, sort of tertiary cities that we think will yield good opportunities. But, you know, brokers, great intermediaries, debt is available. It's affordable. Data is pretty reliable, you know, rule of law is strong, infrastructure works, um, currency is stable, there's no exchange controls, there's a very clear and stable tax regime. You know, a lot of these issues that we we vex over in, in more frontier markets are all taken as given and, and sort of standard in Canada. So in that sense, we go back to it as a, a relative um, sort of safe haven. Well, I just wanted to just to give a little clarity on Ambit for our listeners. Will you, do you focus on investing in traditional search funds? Will you do self-funded? If someone has a deal opportunity uh, and they're not a traditional searcher, they're self-funded or they're um, 
they're just looking for for capital for their deal opportunity as a searcher uh, without a traditional fund would you uh, welcome th uh, them or is your focus really on starting with uh, searchers right from the right from the beginning and helping them with their traditional fund and then obviously growing with them as they find that acquisition and supporting them to get to close yeah so it's traditional only at this stage and our fund one will stick to traditional funded searches only the reason being though is not for lack of philosophical belief in self-funded deals or even on the other side of the spectrum search accelerators which you see cropping up all over the world uh with 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 great success it's just a matter of us being able to manage the volat the volatility and sort of complexity of our portfolio so if our fund one will hopefully back between 50 and 60 searchers around the world. And our view is that we can't manage different deal types across different markets. So we've chosen to add complexity with geography. And so we're keeping simplicity with deal structure and sort of search fund format. So we don't do self-funded because those are always bespoke deals. Searchers get their own economics. The capital stack is put together differently. Um, and in that sense, we can't afford to negotiate that every time and apply our mind to those incentives every different time on a bespoke basis. So one of the, I suppose, pros and cons of traditional funded search is that it just goes off the back of the sort of Stanford, Harvard traditional search economics. And so we take out all the friction from the system of negotiating with searchers and, and worrying about legals. Um, they all just fo follow that, that common template around the world, even though there's jurisdictional nuance into how those principles get applied in, in the actual legal language, you, you know you're not trying to reinvent the wheel with every deal. And that's something we just, it's a complexity we can't afford. So it's not that we don't love self-funded searches and we want to see them succeed. And similarly, accelerators and, and other sort of entrepreneur and residence models that we see around the world, we would love to see those flourish. It's just we're trying to stick to our knitting with uh, with our fund one and, and keep it traditional, traditional only. That being said, though, Mario, we will, we do look at traditional equity gaps. So a traditional funded searcher that we didn't participate in that's found a deal and is sticking to the Harvard, Stanford sort of legal template and economics uh, with co-investors we know and trust, uh, we do look at gaps all the time. So, but it, but only in the traditional lane, if that makes sense. Absolutely. Rob, I always ask our guests uh, the kind of crystal ball question about where the market's going and, and you know, one of the fascinating things for me, and, and frankly, your ambit is a reflection of it, which is, uh, you know, the search fund deals, and frankly, the lower middle market in general, has really done well during COVID, sounds strange to say, but has, you know, deal activity still been strong. Uh, uh, there's a lot of, on, you know, entrepreneurs who, who have really um, wanted to take up this model of entrepreneurship through acquisition there's there's talent this continues to grow uh I, I wanted to get a sense you know given where we're at and given where ambit is and where it wants to go wh where do you think this market is going and uh and obviously from your perspective you bring both the global and the, i guess the, the canadian element to it but when you when you see what what the future holds and i guess in the in the context of ambit uh what do you think is coming up ahead uh, for this market, for these type of investments, for this, uh, for these opportunities? Mm. Well, I think your overarching observation that the lower middle market stood up through all this volatility just speaks to its fundamental idiosyncratic nature, right? Like small businesses by definition are only a couple wins away from really creating value and the key person or, or, key pair of operators in that business have enough agency to sometimes make those wins happen regardless of what's going on in the broader market or industry. You know, there's just, it, it's, it's so small and idiosyncratic that it can be uncorrelated to the broader market. So even if the whole economy is struggling through COVID, there's still these unique pockets of value to create through search uh, or through entrepreneurship, through acquisition more broadly. And, and I think that's just true. When we look at our thesis and sort of like big bets, we're putting on, on our strategy. I think there's one is just the ongoing demographic pressure on baby boomer sellers sort of coming to a liquid, needing to come to a liquidity event. If anything, COVID's accelerating that and the sort of mounting sort of complexity and uncertainty in the world is making a lot of older business owners get more and more willing, we think to, to take cash off the table and, and walk away, which only means better buying opportunities. For, for young searchers that are willing to, to to sort of take the calculated risk. 
in going for it. And then the other thing we see is just an evolution of entrepreneurship through acquisition into the rest of the world. If you rewind 30 or 40 years when even large cap private equity was a new thing um, or early stage venture capital was a new thing, you saw that asset class sort of develop and take root in North America and then sort of move to Europe and then proliferate around the world. And entrepreneurship through acquisition and search in particular is still very much at the nascent stage, right? I mean, there's been probably less than 600 traditional search funds the world over, close to 400 or, um, in North America. And so there's, you know, less than 200 funds around the world in some big economies like, you know, the like France and Italy and Germany, um, Australia, you know, South Korea. We're working on the first search there with a really exciting pair. These are huge economies with tens of thousands of SMEs, and we're talking like three or four search funds. You know, so they're just still as an asset class, as a model to go unlock value in the lower middle market. They're still just scratching the surface, and that's a big wave we hope to to not only catch, but hope hope um, we we can push it ourselves a little bit and help catalyze the the evolution and growth of, of the asset class abroad. Rob, uh, I'm excited for both of us. When I hear you, it, it makes it even more exciting because <laughs> well, I, I feel like you said it very well. We're, we're just on the cusp, you know, for all the talk about how many searchers are out there, or how, uh, how far can this go? I, I think you said it best. I think it's just at the beginning. Uh, so it's, mm. it's incredible opportunities. Yeah. And even in dense markets or, markets that often I think in the community you, you worry about saturation you know there's always talk of how many search funds is too much or you often hear it crop up with Spain because it's, it's really caught like wildfire there as a model and sometimes this this makes it uh, this like glosses over a very serious debate about saturation and how many opportunities can there be for search funds in a country but it's a bit also like asking that there aren't enough people in a market to sort of you know date and meet and fall in love and get married you know like as long as there's, you know, there's almost someone out there for everyone. And on some level, uh, it's not to say that there's endless and countless solid, small private companies to buy for searchers. But, you know, in a market the size of Canada, I don't think anyone needs to be stressing out about 40 or 50 searchers searching at once. You know, there's there's just untold opportunity um, in the lower middle market. Uh, it's just a matter of the origination horsepower to to find the opportunities. And I think search is uniquely positioned for that, right? You have very, very talented, very, very well incentivized entrepreneurs with fire in their belly to go out there and find great targets. And uh, that's still true in the U.S. today and Canada today, you know, and, and, the, and those are the most evolved search markets out there. So I, I don't think I think we're a long way off from any form of saturation. And that's even more true in, in more frontier markets where the, the models yet to take root. Rob, I want to say thank you for joining us today. It's been uh, it's been great to hear about Ambit and uh, great to hear about the space and learning about entrepreneurship through acquisition and uh, the work that you're doing with searchers uh, and search funds. Uh, thank you. I look forward to uh, seeing more of Ambit in our marketplace and, and congratulations on your raise and your first close and, and good luck with your second closing in the future to come. Thanks so much, Mario. I appreciate the time and uh, being invited. It's been a, been a lot of fun. Thank you.